Hi, thank you for joining us on the Odgers Burnson One Question interview. Um, my name is Jules McKean and I run the media practice for Odgers Burnson Executive Search out of London. Um, today on our Spring One Question, I'm joined by the legendary Stuart Baxter from Entertainment One. Thank you for joining me, Stuart. Thank you, Jules. Stuart, who probably needs very little introduction, is the president of international distribution at Entertainment One, the entertainment arm of Hasbro Inc. Stuart joined E1 in 2014, and he now oversees E1's global sales team, acquisitions, co-production ventures, production financing and strategic partnerships, as well as worldwide film and television distribution across traditional and digital platforms and home entertainment. Prior to E1, Stuart ran Sony Pictures TV distribution businesses across EMEA for 10 years, and before that, he headed up Warner Brothers Corporate Development Unit in Europe. Stuart started his career as an engineer and then moved into consultancy in the media world. Early stints at BSB and Sky led him to set up Maxat, a forerunner to Globecast, as it's been known today. That startup stimulated his entrepreneurial interests, and he's non exec director of two smaller media businesses, helping to accelerate their growth. Stuart's key focus is identifying how the demand for content is changing as consumers, consumer behaviours have switched from physical products like DVD and pay TV channels to online streaming. Which, of which I'm sure we'll discuss today. With the advent of the new global streamers and their associated strength in the market, much of his time is now spent working alongside his creative partners at E1, identifying how to fund and distribute both Hasbro and new film and TV shows. Outside of work, Stuart's a keen sportsman and an avid Irish rugby fan. He, he plays golf, squash and tennis and is married with three pretty much grown up children. Stuart, thank you for joining us today. And it's time for me to ask you the one question which of all of this crazy year we've had, is there anything that our industry has learned from this pandemic? Oh, I think so. I think, you know, um, probably foremost, just how resilient uh, the industry's been. It's, it's been robust. It's encouraged a lot of innovation. And we've seen, you know, some underlying trends that were going to happen anyway have been accelerated. But, um, Overall, the industry's in pretty good shape considering you know, what's happened to other industries. We're not in the same position as the hospitality or the travel industry, anything else. If anything, consumers are, are watching more than they've ever watched. Yes. Fabulous. We found ways that even the legacy model that people were writing off traditional linear TV because more people have been at home, more people have yeah. had time to hands, so you can't go to the pub, you can't go to the gym, do anything else. People are watching ITV and BBC in bigger numbers than they have for years. Yes. So that's helped the traditional business. The streamers, probably the biggest beneficiaries. Yes. Uh, they've all the new services that launched Peacock, HBO Max, you know, Disney Plus, now staff at Disney, more and more services being launched everywhere. Subscriptions to those have grown tremendously. So uh, production's been probably the challenging part yeah, of the business. Yeah, how have you guys managed that, Stuart? Because that must have been kind of a really odd and sudden immersion in how do we get huge craving for content around the world and how do we do that in a safe way? Look, the, it really has varied country to country. So in places like Canada, thankfully one of our, you know, where our business started, um, COVID is actually, we put in protocols very early. Right. Uh, the frankly pandemic's been managed to an extent that all five big dramas that we were producing last year we got done yes there are protocols and production takes a bit longer and is, a, is more expensive but were we still able to produce everything yes in some countries like the uk and the us that was more difficult yeah uh, we still did it but it was the delays were even longer the cost increases yes. were even bigger but what we suddenly found is you can do light entertainment shows, you can do interview shows. Our non-scripted business delivered sort of uh, professional level sort of cameras to the likes of oh, wow. Jamie, Jamie Oliver, who was shooting at home. And, you know, outside Jamie Oliver's house in Wandsworth was a, you know, a, literally a mobile van with, you know, they were doing live editing and cutting and going out daily. And frankly, the cost of that production is a fraction of the normal cost. So we and saw ups and downs, increased costs somewhere. Yeah, and sorry, I was just going to say, it probably meant people felt a bit closer to 
to the person on the other side of the screen because you're really being invited into their home. There's something quite personal about that, isn't there? Yeah, look, I think we find it in all of us, you know, I'm sure you like me spend hours every day on Zoom or Teams or one of the other apps, uh, and you are literally in people's homes. It's, yeah. it's, not, easy, it's not always easy, um, but it has given a sort of more personal side to the industry generally. Yeah, I think that's very, I think that's very interesting. And kind of going back to this streamers and traditional and the kind of the, the changing nature of that landscape, you know, the fact that you guys are so platform agnostic must have been very useful for you in the last year. Yes, that um, the, the global streamers have you know, got a lot of heft in the market at the yeah. moment and they have been uh, absorbing an awful lot of the talent, commissioning their own shows. Yeah. Um, and with, you know, many broadcasters used to have to rely on shows from Disney and Warner Brothers and Paramount. But these people all have their own streaming networks now, so they want those shows themselves for them. Yeah. So less available. So to be a large independent, to be, frankly, Lionsgate, MGM, E1 over the last year, there's a lot more people to produce for as an yes. independent. So we, we, we make for and sell to every one of the platforms, the streamers, the networks, and the indies. How interesting. And how is that you know, looking to the future for you guys? How, with, with, with Hasbro in the mix as well, what has that done to you? Are you excited about what that can, what that can kind of create? Look, uh, you know, I think we were very lucky in timing wise. Hasbro had only just acquired us. Yes. So for one, you know, it was pre-pandemic. Um, but naturally, when you're acquired, the acquiring company has a, a real reason for you doing so. It has a strategic purpose. Yes. And it allowed us to put more emphasis behind that strategic purpose. The when they acquired us. Hasbro basically reverted its prior entertainment assets into E1. So we really became the, the whole uh, entertainment arm of Hasbro. And they wanted us to develop their IP as much as just producing new IP, mm. um, which was E1 previously was focused on a lot of third party product because we were first and foremost a distribution company. Yeah. The, the new iteration of E1 is very much a producer, developer, packager, and distributor, mm. where we focused first and foremost on distribution previously. And you see Hasbro have increased the amount of money where we're investing in talent yeah. and new IP. So we've added Jonathan Entwistle to do Power Rangers. We brought in Bo Willerman, who wrote House of Cards, to write Risk. We brought in James Patterson, the prolific no novelist. We're number of shows with James we bought in the Clarks and twins who are making you know who wrote One Tree Hill for Netflix and are producing Red Road uh, Red Rose for us in the UK for BBC so we wow. were investing in a lot more talent um, and a lot of that is attached to Hasbro IP both yeah. scripted and non-scripted so Monopoly we've got a project um, Mousetrap uh, wow. these are brands that yeah to tv that hadn't previously really been bought to tv yeah. which is how exciting and i suppose you know everybody's been living in this you know every, our whole worlds have been streamed haven't they personal <laughs> professional you know leisure have been it's been a streaming world for all of us in the last year when we all venture out dust ourselves off and kind of you know glimpsing into the sort of you know vaccinated future how, how do you think do you think there's going to be a change in the way that people, you know, that people view content and people engage with content? Is there something that you guys are looking at and kind of constantly measuring? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. Look, and it's a personal rather than a corporate take, but I think a lot of the behaviours that we've seen evolve over the 18 months are not going to change. You know, yes, a lot of people have watched ITV and BBC because they've been at home and because they've been available. But even more people have signed up to new streaming subscription services. I suspect when time becomes less available because the gyms and the restaurants are, are open and all the other pastimes and frankly just going around to a friend's house, you know, all of those things, 
the it's likely the linear numbers will fall back. Uh, that's going to have in, interesting connotations in its own right yeah. for the linear industry. I think there's a couple of likely trends there. But for the streaming world, I think you know it's unlikely that you'll see suddenly at the end of COVID people turning subscriptions off. Yeah. If any, you know, more and more is being invested by them in more and more programming. You suddenly see, you know, Amazon investing hugely in NFL recently. There's yeah, absolutely. You know, they're really moving into the traditional entertainment. Uh, and it's simply, you know, aimed at laptops and phones and iPads. Yeah. Uh, what we've also seen through streaming is an awful lot of people now connecting smart TVs to these apps. So getting much more viewing now than it was 15 months ago or a year ago on uh, TVs. It, it had huge viewing, but it, that was very laptop and uh, yeah. tablet electric. That's migrating. And going back to the linear guys, if numbers do go back to where they were pre or worse, go even below that, I think you'll start to see them. Uh, the good news is I think you'll see a lot of them innovate. I think they'll put a lot more, they've realized this, um, if you like, functionality of watching what you want, where you want, when yeah. you want. Um, yeah. The on-demand functionality yes. is too, too central to entertainment going forwards. Yeah. And what you'll see is them putting more emphasis behind their digital services. And interestingly, seeing Alex Mann a week or two yeah. ago about what she said, you know, Channel 4 has to make digital first. Yes. We used to, we used to call it catch-up. The digital was a catch up yeah. ability. It, it wasn't the, the sort of primary means of consumption. I think that's going to flip. It's just a matter of how, how and when. It sounds like you're both impressed by the resilience of your industry in the past year because everyone's had to pivot so much, but also pretty optimistic about the ability to carry on innovating because actually the kind of habits that normally take a very long time to form. We've actually had a full year of, of, of bedding in those habits. And as you say, people are now used to lots of fantastic content and demanding more and more from, from, from content makers. Um, it sounds like you are optimistic though, Stuart, for what you guys can achieve in the, in the coming years coming out of COVID. Very much so, you said. Resilience at the heart of it, uh, a lot of innovation showing through, consumers, even more engaged than ever in the consumption yeah. of content. Um, and, you know, frankly, if you've been in the industry as long as I have, we all like opportunities to, to learn and to evolve. Uh, and it's given us all opportunities to do that. So uh, I think it's personally, it's been, you know, there's, it's been challenging, you know, for a lot of people. But our industry as a whole is, has been more fortunate. Uh, because yeah. fundamentally, yeah. people are still spending money, uh, whether it's on subscriptions or watching TV, and yeah. that creates opportunities for all of us. And I think it's, it's probably been a, a real lifesaver for getting us all out of our own boxes at home as well, to where we've been able to con consume fantastic content. Um, Stuart, thank you so much for joining us on the Odd Just Bones and One Question. A lot to think about, and I really appreciate you taking the time, and, and have a, I'm sure you will, a very great year. Uh, that's very kind, Jules. Thanks a lot. Hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you.